if you think about it, the most complicated thing that an ancient human would meet in their lives would not be food, nor at all, not a predator, but another person. The bottom line is that it's other people, not the world itself, that's difficult to deal with. To work out the motives of others, to persuade, to charm, to make friends and not enemies, all this takes brains. We can see it in action with our closest relatives. Chimps are constantly vying with one another to be leader of the troop. Here, a young male chimp is attempting to usurp the older male. And while fights are certainly dramatic, often more important than just brute strength is the ability to forge alliances with other chimps. Brain over brawn. Chimps spend hours and hours picking through the hair of their colleagues. It's called grooming, and it's the key to social climbing. The better chimps are at these social niceties, the more likely they are to rise through the ranks. Scientists have now discovered that the more complex the social group an animal species belongs to, the bigger its brain will be. An ability to deceive, to make allies, to win others over, must have been vital in the development of the chimp mind. Sound familiar? Human societies are the most complicated of all animal societies. There's continual pressure to be number one. And where better to look for it but in the corridors of power? While the ceremony of parliamentary life looks rather splendid, it's the jostling that goes on behind the scenes that is often more important. Politicians huddle together in conspiratorial whispers. Deals are made and broken. The MPs, the Lords and Ladies, are demonstrating skills that haven't changed for millions of years. I should know, I work in the place. We're not chimps, but it's a jungle out there. And you don't have to go to the Houses of Parliament to come across politics. All the time, our brains are dealing with politics with a small p. Gossip, flattery, backbiting. At home or in the office, it's really just our way of getting along with people. Over millions of years, the human brain and body have evolved to meet ever more complicated challenges. We learned to manipulate tools. We made full use of our visual sense and we developed a powerful memory. More recently, we mastered language, a highly efficient form of social grooming. We can now build up a detailed picture of the brain we've evolved. The cerebellum, responsible for automatic movements back of the brain for vision, the frontal cortex for memory. There's even a particular site for language and another for our social skills. But there's still something missing from this map. It's the mysterious thing that makes you who you are and me who I am. Scientists call it consciousness. Consciousness is the greatest of the brain's qualities. It's actually very difficult to define, but essentially it's our ability to be aware of our own thoughts and feelings, for each of us to have our own personality. Without consciousness, we'd be little more than robots, trundling through the motions of life. Consciousness allows us to appreciate the greater things in life, love, art, science, and religion. Consciousness makes our brain more than just a collection of little gray cells and electricity. It's what makes us truly human. As a subject, consciousness is extremely difficult to study. 
but a series of extraordinary surgical operations have revealed some startling new facts. This rather sad story began in the 1960s. Brain surgeons, desperate to treat their severely epileptic patients, pioneered an operation to try and control epileptic fits. Good. Okay, Dave, I'm going to start to divide the corpus callosum. This dramatic surgery involved slicing the brain right down the middle. They hoped to restrict future fits to one side of the brain only. It was a radical approach, but the patients had such severe epilepsy, this was their last hope. The operation usually worked, but it had some unfortunate side effects in a few patients. Vicky is one such patient. Afterwards, scientists discovered that the surgery appeared to give her two independent minds, each controlling one half of her body. It became apparent even when Vicky got dressed. I knew what I wanted to wear, and I would open up my closet, and a couple times one hand would like get ready to take it out, but my other hand would like just take control. And a couple times I had a pair of shorts on, and then I find myself putting another pair of shorts on on top of a pair I already had on, and which I knew was I knew was wrong. I wouldn't go out the house that way. Each of her hands is obeying one half of her brain. It's as if her consciousness has been split in half. Two minds in her one brain. This is extraordinary. If our consciousness is located in just one side of the brain, it can never be separated into two in the way that it is for Vicky. So I cannot point at one part of my brain and say that is where I reside. Put simply, consciousness is part of the whole brain. Perhaps, in the same mysterious way that the termites work together in the colony, so the many elements which make up our consciousness work in harmony. It looks like the higher abilities of the brain, memory, perception, and emotions, are seamlessly bound into one wonderful whole. But is there more to it than this? As a scientist, I believe that science is the most powerful way of finding out about the human body. Even so, there will always be some questions that it just cannot answer. As a religious person, I believe that much of what makes us human will forever remain mysterious even spiritual. I call it the soul.